Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, remove the veil. Help us see Jesus. That as we behold his face, we would see your glory. And by that revelation of that glory, may we be changed. May we be changed from inside out. In the name of Jesus. May we know the king who reigns. He reigns in holiness. He reigns in power. He reigns in glory. May we know him. May he reign in us. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Today we begin a new series on the subject of faith. Let's have our seats. As we contemplate this topic of faith today, today we want to talk about the test of faith. There's a reason we are starting with the test of faith. Because in recent times, different people in this apostolic company received the same word that points to the fact that the Lord Jesus is evaluating us. I remember I sent the word to our leaders and I told them that in the month of April the Lord will send us evaluation. He will send us evaluation. And true to the word, the prophetic word that came that period through God's servant Paul Yari was about 30 minutes of prophetic evaluation. And the Lord was saying one simple thing that many have not believed the word of the Lord for the season. And this is not manipulation, it's not an, a, a ploy to force people to believe or to push people to the edge. Most times it's because people have not built the capacity for faith. And so when a task is given, when a prophetic word is given, the ability of the people to reach out in faith is one thing. And we're not going to rush the topic. We're going to take it systematically. Today, what I want to say can be said in five minutes. But I want to give a background to that statement. The test of faith can be taught in just five minutes. But the background will help you understand why that five minute word is so important. Because the Lord is evaluating us. I remember in the book of Luke, where the Lord Jesus Christ said, chapter 18, I think verse 8, so when the Son of Man shall come, return to the earth. We least still find faith on the earth. Which means that there's something he's looking for and hoping to see when he returns. And it's called faith. Faith is so important that of all the things he's asking for is, would I still find faith on the earth? Let me put it in social cultural language. He's simply saying, will I still find Christianity on the earth? It's a simple way of putting it also. Will I still find authentic Christianity on the earth? Or will he have changed? Will he have updated it? that's what's happening so you see the world the world does not want to believe but they are now pressuring the believers to update their Christianity so we like the Christian faith it's the most funky of them all we have lights and sounds and music you know we don't have religious garbs to wear we don't have phylacteries to choke our worship, how come we cannot adjust at least the doctrine to embrace the cultural evolution? Why can't, since your message is love, which is not, why can't you just allow the gays to be together since they love each other? And so many perversions are being paraded and being peddled and lobbied for to be included in our belief system. 
And God is saying, will you cave to that? When I return, will I find the faith as it was entrusted? Oh, Jude was contending for. So I'm writing this to you so that we can contend for the faith that was once entrusted to us. Because there have been what? Spies have crept in amongst us trying to pervert the grace of God as license for sin. So many perversions have come in over the years. The question is how many of them have now been institutionalized? How many of them have replaced the true gospel? So for that reason, Christ says, well, I still find faith on the earth. And if you reach back to creation, you find out that there's a reason and there's a way God created us. We were created to worship God. That's one of the reasons we were created. That was one of the designs behind our creation. We were created to worship. In other words, if you are created to worship, you must be given the ability to worship. So what is the ability to worship that was given to us? It's called faith. Faith is the capacity that was in, invested in man so that man can worship him. But the world doesn't know this because our design can only be discovered by what revelation. Since the world does not know why we were created, so therefore they do not know why they have the capacity to believe. So they thought belief was just a resource given to them to maximize life. They've turned into positive confession, to positive thinking, to affirmation, and so many other things. They've used it to pursue other religions and other kinds of things. But today we want to draw it back to him for whom we were designed. That's the reason we start with these worship songs. He reigns forever. His name is forever great. You are the wisdom before time began. It's for the reason that we sing and praise his name and, and remind us of who we were designed to worship, for whom our capacity of faith was designed. Amen. So our primary text of scripture will be taken from the book of Romans chapter 1, 16 and 17. If you're there, let's read it. From verse 16, this is what the scripture says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jews first and also for the Greek. For in it, in what? In the gospel of Christ. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So we want to unpack this thing little by little. The first thing we want to understand is the power of God unto salvation. In, Gen in the book of John chapter 3 verse 16, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but will have everlasting life. So in that verse in John, we saw what the motive of God for salvation is what? Love. Love is the motivation behind God giving us salvation. When we go to Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8, it tells us that we are saved by grace through faith. And this faith is not your own, it's a gift of God. In that place we see the means of salvation is grace. We've seen the motivation for salvation is love. The means of salvation is what? Grace. By what did he wrought the salvation? It's grace. The work of Christ on the cross. But in this verse of scripture in Romans, he's telling us there's something called the power of God to salvation. He's saying... He is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed. He is not ashamed of the gospel of God, for it is the power of God unto salvation, and for in it the righteousness of God is revealed. In other words, he is telling us something that the righteousness of God is the power of salvation. 
I need, I need to point this out to you because it's easy for you to read it and think that, no, he said the gospel is the power of salvation. The gospel is very broad. He's not telling you the gospel is the power of salvation. He's showing you something that the gospel reveals. The gospel reveals the righteousness of God. Let me explain little by little. You see, God loved man, loves man so much, he wants to save man. But man had sinned, and there is a law, a capital punishment for sin. The soul that sinned shall what? Die. It cannot be changed. God doesn't break the law. So what does God do? Because he is righteous, he cannot break the law. He now made a provision for our salvation. He brought somebody else to die for our sins because he had to go through a legal path, a legal system to redeem man. So that's why Christ died for us. So now Christ has taken our place. Legally speaking, we too, we take his place. So the son of God became son of man so that the sons of men may become but sons of God. It was a divine exchange. So why did God do it this way? Since he loves man, why didn't he just save man? He could have saved man since he loved man. But he could not. He was limited by the law and by his righteousness. Do you understand this? So for him to overcome that limitation, his righteousness swung into action and created a system for our salvation. So everything followed a pathway because of what? His righteousness. So what is that thing that God could, that the law used in limiting God? The simple thing is that every person that has sinned must die. Sin must be punished. So according to that legal system, there's sin, there's punishment, then there's what? Freedom. It doesn't matter who gets the punishment, but punishment must be served. So Jesus Christ came to take the punishment on behalf of our own sin. Righteousness of God made that possible. I don't know if you're getting this now. Because if God was not a righteous God, he would have just found it in our way. That's why I tell you people that there's no religion that guarantees forgiveness. It's only the gospel that guarantees forgiveness because it was paid for. Do you understand? If somebody buys a car for you in your name, he can collect it back anytime he wants to. Except you cave to sentiment and fear. Say, because he's the one that paid for it. But once it's in your name, you can take the person to court. Say, look at my name is on it now. I own this car. You can't take it from me. Yes, your money's paid for it, but it was given to me. Do you understand? A good example is massage. Somebody paid for you to take a massage. Can you give, return the massage? <laughs> you can't return it. It just happens to be like a car. It happens to be material and something that you can easily struggle with and say whether you want to give back or not. So once it has been paid for in your name, it's yours. Do you understand this? That is why he says the righteousness of God is the power of salvation. That's why it cannot be changed. It's not, it was not sentiment that gave us salvation. It was not emotion. It was not that God was so emotionally in love with us. No. That's why they say the love of God is not what romantic. The love of God is sacrificial. So I want us to go into a deep reading to understand this righteousness again. How is the righteousness of God, the power of God unto salvation? You remember we are studying faith. So we are, but we are going on a journey to understand it well. Rome, Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 14. So we're going to read verse 14 to 17. Skip to verse 23 and read it down to 28. I don't want us to do too many long readings, but I want you to see something interesting here. Say, for it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come, not according to the law of fleshly commandments, but according to the power of an endless life. So, there are two bases which priests used to come in those days, or according to this scripture. 
The first way a priest comes is through the law of fleshly commandment. The second one comes through what? The power of an endless life. A Aaronic priesthood is based on fleshly commandments, but what? The Melchizedek priesthood comes by what? The power of an endless life. I need you to know that. So he's telling you that Jesus Christ comes on the basis of a power of an endless life, not on the basis of a fleshly commandment, okay? Now we're jumping. Okay, let's read verse 17, then jump to 23. For he testifies, you are a priest according to the order of Melchizedek, establishing the fact that Christ came according to the power of an endless life, not on the power of a fleshly commandment. You understand the significance of this soon. So let's read verse 23. And verse 23 says here, also there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. So let me explain a little before I go further. The Old Testament people, their priesthood was not permanent. So Aaron was a priest for as long as he was alive. If he dies, he stops being a priest. Somebody else becomes a priest after him. So what made him a priest was not about his life, quality of his life, but because of some commandments. Fleshly laws were written, and he qualified, and he became high priest. So was every generation of priests. But this priesthood in Melchizedek was an eternal priesthood because he does not die. So they didn't choose him because of some regulations. They chose him because of the power of his life. This man can live forever. So it's best for him to be priest. Do you understand? His life, his ability to live forever. Now, Melchizedek did not live forever. Melchizedek was a human who lived and died. But he was symbolic. And his priesthood was symbolic. So when they talked about the endless life, it was also symbolic. But for Christ, it was literal. He had a true eternal life. He lives forever. Okay? So verse 24 now says, But he, because he continues forever. Do you see this? The basis is what? That he's living forever. That's the basis. Because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save to the uttermost. Do you see that? The power of his salvation is that he lives forever. He is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. I want you to see this clearly. He's telling you because he lives forever, he's able to save completely, powerfully. The power that he has to save is in his ability to live forever. Very important. Verse 26. For such a high priest was fitting. If he lives forever, what makes him live forever? What makes him fitting to be a priest is that he lives forever, right? But look at what he wants to describe living forever now. He says, because he lives forever, he's able to save to the uttermost. And now he says, such a high priest was fitting for us. Who is what? Holy, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. He should have told us he's fitting because he lives forever. But instead he says he's fitting because he's holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. And he has extended far above the heavens. And I explained to us the last time what this means. His holy means what? He's free from sin. He has no record of sin. He's harmless. He has no potential for sin. He is what? Undefiled. He is not contaminated by sin. And he is separate from sinners. He has no potential to be contaminated by sin. Each thing that he has, he also has the potential not to be it. So he is not only holy, which means free from sin, free from the record of sin. He's also free from the potential. That means even the possibility of sinning is not there. No, some people have not sinned because they don't have the opportunity. This one is saying opportunity or no opportunity, he does not have the ability to sin. He's harmless. He has not been contaminated, undefiled. He has not been contaminated by people. The answer is separate from sinner, which means he also is not able to be contaminated. In the Old Testament, you touch a leper, you are unclean. New Testament, he touched the leper, they become clean. He cannot be contaminated. Hallelujah. So, in other words, there is a relationship between this purity, this holiness, and his endless life. What is that connection? Let's see it in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 28. In the way of righteousness, there is life. 
and in its pathway, in the path of that righteousness, there is no death. Do you see that? This is the reason his righteousness and his life, his endless life, are used interchangeably in the book of Hebrews chapter 7. That because he lives forever, he is able to save to the uttermost. He is fitting because he is holy. Because he is what? Harmless. Because he is undefiled and because he is separate from sinners. He is fitting. He is able. In other words, the power by which this priesthood in Christ Jesus is able to save us completely is that he is holy, that he is righteous. That is the power of salvation. We've seen the motivation for salvation. The motive for salvation is love. The means of salvation is grace. The power of salvation is righteousness. The love of God, the grace of God, the righteousness of God. Now, going back to the Romans, our text of Scripture, verse 17, Romans chapter 1, verse 17, says, For in it, that is, the gospel of Christ, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith is actually my focus in today's message. But for us to get there, we need to understand the background. Do you understand? Because God wants to save us, and he's showing us the power of this salvation is the righteousness of God. But he needs us to believe. So he's telling us, your faith will not matter. Have I shared this thing with you before? That your salvation is not dependent by the strength of your faith, but by the object of your faith. What does that mean? It means it does not matter how well you believe. It matters what you believe. Because a voodoo priest can believe so much in voodoo, but he will not be saved because he believes the wrong thing. And you might believe so little in Christ, but you'll be saved because you actually believe. I don't know if I'm communicating. So it is for that reason that this scripture is being shown to us. He's not telling us that this righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. He's telling you what to place your faith in. Place your faith in the righteousness of God. Because there are many Christians today who have updated their Christianity. They believe in God as a loving God, but not as a righteous God. Say, so how will a loving God cast a, 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 a tax-paying, law-abiding gay citizen? Say, for goodness sake, there's nobody as good and kind as this gay brother. So for that reason, they feel this is an unkind God. They believe in him. But see, this is our version of Christianity. We need to change it. I don't know if I get what I'm trying to say here. God is telling you how to place that salvation, that faith in yourself. For your salvation to be real, you must place it in that righteousness. So the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. So our second point is the two dimensions of faith mentioned here. The two dimensions of faith. So he says that the righteousness of God is revealed from faith. It's also revealed to faith. In your mind, you might think he's saying he's revealed from faith to faith, meaning from one level of faith to another level of faith. That is part of it. But one thing I need you to see is this, that what he's saying, first of all, is that the source and foundation of our revelation of God's righteousness is that we believe. For that righteousness to exist inside of us, we must believe. That's the foundation of it. So that's the first dimension of faith we must have. That we believe. The second dimension of faith there has to do with faith being a container for that righteousness to increase. That's why we now get the levels of faith. Because if your faith does not increase, 
the level of righteousness will not increase in you. And let me explain because you might think I'm saying the righteousness of God fluctuates or something like that. That's what I'm referring to. The point is this, that the way you view God is the way he will manifest to you. So you don't think of God as a healer, for instance. You just feel that, oh, God is just a forgiving God. And when you are sick, you don't pray for healing. The likelihood that you will have an experience of healing will be small. Of course, sometimes God bypasses your unbelief. It happened to the man on the, on the, beside the, the, the waters of Bethsaida. The man didn't believe. Because Christ was asking him questions. He kept giving excuses upon excuses. At the end of the day, Christ just said, just pick up your bed, get up and walk. He bypassed his unbelief in that moment. But there are moments, the majority of the time, when you don't believe there will be no supernatural things. The Bible says he could not work many miracles because of their unbelief. That statement implies he worked some miracles. I don't know if you're getting this. He worked what some miracles, but not many miracles. Why? They did not believe. So their lack of faith reduced how much he could do in their midst. So it's important for us to now learn to increase the faith. The first part of the faith there is that the faith is what helps us to receive, what helps us to contain the righteousness of God. But there's a second part which has to do with us increasing that manifestation. There are things that God wants to show you in that salvation that you cannot experience until your face, faith is stretched. So why does he now say, because we read all of these things, and it ends by saying something interesting. Say, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. The first thing you must understand by that statement is that he's telling you the Christian life is a life of faith. And to give you perspective of what that means is like the human life. The human life is a life of oxygen. There's some things you can fast. You can fast water, you can fast food, you can fast TV, you can fast anything, but you can't fast oxygen. You can't say, I'm going on a three days fast, I'm not going to breathe. You understand? As married couples, you can fast sex. You, you get what I'm saying here? But you can't fast oxygen. That's what it is for the Christian. The believer cannot fast or break away from faith. So the Bible says the just shall live by faith. So let's go back to Romans again to get the context from verse 17. First, Romans chapter 1, verse 17 says, For it is, for in it, that is the gospel of Christ, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So he's telling you for you to have enough life, enough breath, enough oxygen for your Christian race on a daily basis, you must have more daily revelation of the righteousness of God. Daily revelation of the power of your salvation. Because certain times the Lord is trying to do something in your life a good example, let me use simple, simple example. Somebody wants to marry. He says, ah, my mates, all of them are married. In fact, they're celebrating three-year anniversary, four years anniversary. I am not yet married. So you now say, perhaps the Lord is not able to get me a husband or a wife. You begin to have doubts. That is, you don't believe this God is righteous enough to get you a spouse. That's what he's talking about. But remember I told you the righteousness of God is referring to the power of your salvation. And salvation is not just about you being saved from sin, saved from destruction. It's you being saved from all the challenges and problems of your life. So you're saying God cannot save me from this, this problem I have. You have an issue that is financial. It's humongous. You just believe. Let me tell you a story. A friend of mine did a business he has been doing business with this group of people for a long time. One client now brings half a billion, and he does business with this old and reliable customer. But that was the first time that man had that kind of money. He has handled big money before, 100 million, all those things. 
And if you calculate the turnover, it's more than half a billion. But this time around, in one business, half a billion came. And this, his vendor, disappears. How do you think you handle that kind of thing? You know you don't have over 100 million saved up anywhere. You don't have any property worth 100 million to say, let me even say, let alone half a billion. You know how they took it to the Lord in prayer. Pray this heart out. There are several ways God can help you. The major one is God will give you the money and you pay back. Or God will catch the person and you pay back. You know how God did it this time around? The person who lost the half a billion forgave him. See, canceled. It's called the power of salvation. God knows how he will sort it out. Do you judge him righteous enough to do it? So he's not asking you to employ your faith, deploy your faith to see his revelation of that righteousness. You need it on a daily basis. You need a daily dose of faith for that righteousness of God, that he is able to do it. But we don't trust him enough. I'm saying the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. The more we believe, the more we see more of his righteousness. The more we believe, the more we see that God is righteous to save. He's righteous to save. He's able to save. You know what it means? Let me explain to you on that, on that concept about what it means for God to be righteous to save. It means if he does not save, he's not righteous, number one. Number two, it means that his character is at stake. So for that reason, he will want to save you. I must save this person to prove to them that I am righteous. So he's telling you, do you believe that on a daily basis? Because let me give an example. This person... That was not the first time it happened to him. The first time it happened to him was about six million. That time he was still a staff. So he was earning like 20,000, 30,000, but he was doing business to, on, by the side. And he did a business that six to 12 million went bad. He dried all he could, tried to raise the money, tried to catch the perpetrator of this crime. He could not. So you know what he did? He went to meet the people, the business partners, and said, this is evidence, this is everything. I didn't steal your money. The person ran away with it. He said, we believe you. And to show you that we forgive you, we are secret to do business with you. After that one is when the half a billion happened. For so many people, they say, ah, God said, go don't tire for me. That's how we judge God. Righteousness is not like that. I'm not, talking about, I'm not talking about grace now. This is, not about, this is about God's nature. Grace is the transmission between you and God. Righteousness is God individually, independent of you. He said, I am righteous to save. That is the power, that's the basis of our salvation, that he is righteous to save. Do you believe him that much? On a daily basis. So you must believe. You must believe. So to understand this statement that he says, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Let's go to where it is written. Hebrews, Habakkuk, sorry, Habakkuk chapter 2, from verse 2 to 4. In Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 2 to 4, from verse 2 of Habakkuk, chapter 2, he says, Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak, and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold the proud... His soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. I know this English looks somehow, say, ah, he's talking about right divisions. 
What he's saying is this, that there's a vision that you are counting on. Write it down. Don't be afraid. Don't think it will, it will delay. Even if it delays, it will, still come to, it will still happen at the end of the day. He now tells you the reason that is the case, because the just shall live by faith. But there's a bigger context to this, because it begins by saying, the Lord answered me and said. So what question went before this? You need to study chapter 1. So we're going to summarize chapter 1 for, for us by reading just three or four verses there. In chapter 1 of Habakkuk, verse 5 and 6, Habakkuk starts by saying, let's read verse 1 and 2 to see what, what's going on here. This is the prophet's burden. The prophet of God had a burden. Prophet Habakkuk had a burden, and the burden says this. The burden which prophet Habakkuk saw, O Lord, how long shall I cry? And you will not hear. Even cry out to you, violence, and you will not save. So he saw his government had become a mafia. So he cried out to God. Say, God, what is this I'm seeing? This is Israel. This is God's people. Why are we turning into a cartel? Why is there violence, state-sponsored violence? You know Boko Haram is sponsored by the government. God's response. Look at God's response now. In verse 5 and 6, we get the response of God. God says, look among the nations and watch. Be utterly outstanding. For I will walk a walk in your day which you would not believe, though it were told you. For indeed, I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation which marches through the breath of the earth to possess dwellings that are not theirs. Ah. So God now says, because of this, your mafia government, I'm going to send foreigners. The Babylonians are going to come and deal with this, your government. The prophet that thought maybe God had rescued him, now became more perplexed. Look at his, the, the prophet's reaction. The prophet reacts in verse 12. The prophet now begins to speak, say, oh, say, are you not from everlasting, oh Lord God? He began to worship God first because he wants to complain. So let, me, let me worship him before he thunders against me. So he worshiped God first. He said, oh you, say, are you not from everlasting, oh Lord God? Are you, oh Lord God, my holy one? Why shall, say, sorry, we shall not die. Oh Lord, you have appointed them for judgment. Speaking about the Chaldeans, I mean the nations. Say, so, oh rock, you have marked them for correction. You are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. You know what wickedness is talking about? Let's read. So why do you look on those who deal treacherously? And hold your tongue when the wicked divorce a person more righteous than he. So he's saying, Babylonians are more of greater sinners than we, the Israelites. And you want to great, use greater sinners to punish us of lesser sin. Say, Abba, you are too holy to behold sin. That statement is very important because that's what we use in interpreting New Testament. Let's read that statement again. You are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. Look at the next verse. Why do you look? You are too holy to look at evil. Why do you look at it? In other words, when people used to preach and say Jesus Christ was on the cross, and when darkness covered it, the earth was because God turned his back on Jesus. God never turned his back on Jesus on the cross. Jesus was not abandoned on the cross. He was sacrificed on the cross. There's a difference. So you say, God, because he carried the sin of the whole world, therefore God was not looking, he will no longer look at Jesus Christ. That's not true. This is the origin of that statement, that God cannot behold iniquity. But that is even a misinterpretation of the verse, because he is telling you that the prophet thought that God could not look at evil. He doesn't say, but I thought you could not look at evil. How come you are looking at this evil happen to us? A sinner nation punishing us of lesser sin. But that is a teaching for another day. We'll come back to the cross. When we talk about it, we'll explain that more. But I just want you to throw that away, okay? God did not abandon Jesus on the cross. He sacrificed him on the cross. Did Abraham abandon Isaac on the altar? So, it is 
from this place that God now chose to respond to Habakkuk. He now says, oh, you are asking for the deliverance of Israel. I now showed you the judgment of Israel by an unholy nation. He now said, Kai, the vision is for an appointed time. The full judgment that I will unleash to bring all things back to order is for an appointed time. That's the origin of Habakkuk chapter 2. So that means before I will judge Babylon, I will have to judge Israel. So you wait for Israel's judgment to pass, wait for Babylon's judgment to pass, they now wait for the kingdom of God to come. <clears throat> That's what he's saying. So he's now saying, because of this, the just shall live by faith. Because it takes faith to believe that this thing that is not going according to the original plan that I hoped, because the original plan he, he was hoping was that instead of God to bring the Babylonians, that he would bring the Messiah. Someone more holy than the nation. But he brought somebody one more sinful than the nation. So for them, it was hard to comprehend. So God is telling them that this vision that you are waiting for, the one you are actually praying for, is long in the future. Are you getting this? To understand it further, let's go to the book of Hebrews where the apostle begins to write from a New Testament perspective this same thing that Habakkuk wrote. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36 to 39. For you have need of what? Endurance. Are you seeing the thing? Very similar to what God was telling Habakkuk. You are waiting for the Messiah. I'm telling the Babylonians to come first. <laughs> you are waiting for change. I'm telling you that certain things will happen to, hap will have to happen first. So you have to be, in, to be patient and endure. So it says, you have need of patience so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Have you noticed that the language has changed? In Habakkuk, he says, the vision is for an appointed time. Though it tarry, it shall surely come. He changes it towards he. So I want you to understand what Habakkuk was being told was not about an it, but about a, a he. And we all know who the he is. It's Jesus, the king of kings. Because he was expecting the king of kings to come. Instead, he sent the king of Babylon. And if you study the book of Daniel, you know that Bab and the king of Babylon is also called king of kings. <laughs> so here, a false king of kings was released first in the book of Habakkuk. New Testament is now showing us why. Because he who is coming may tarry, but will not really tarry. Because he will surely come. So for yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. For that salvation to be complete, the people must believe to the point of the saving of the soul. Amen. Amen. So, in this scripture, what we have just learned is this. God is simply saying that there are certain promises, certain plans, certain programs that God is doing in the nations, in your life, and they require faith because they take a process to get to you. Before the vision will materialize, it will take a process. Habakkuk was actually asking for that vision. Say, when will this vision come? And God said to him, first the Babylonians. Say, Babylonians, this is counter to your nature. Say, do you really know my nature? So the Babylonians will come first. They too will be judged. You just watch and see. There is one who is coming. To him, judgment has been committed. He will judge them all. So you and I might be in that phase also where the Lord has told us something. He has told you, I'm giving you the gift of healing. And then somebody will fall sick in your house. And perhaps the person will seek and die. You remember the story of Hadassah? in the book, uh, Mark of the Lion series. Her brother was encouraging the family, saying to them, God will always keep a remnant. Hadassah was fearful, begging her brother, 
to pray with her, to strengthen her faith. And when the Romans came and invaded, guess what? The brother who was encouraging them was one that they killed. She that was fearful was one that was now the remnant. But she had already been educated by that word from her brother. That's what kept her through her trials. At that time, she needs that faith because the just will live by faith. The just will what live by faith. It's a delicate place that we are in because some words that we are expecting the Lord to fulfill will take time. And I want you to remember how it is for so many of the people who got promised. Some of them, their word took generations. It's for that reason he's asking, when I come, will I still find faith on the earth? I need you to see the background of those statements. Because when he's telling you that the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, he's telling you one thing. That revelation is for an appointed time. You want to see the revelation of how God is righteous in this situation? It might take you a time. What will keep you from the beginning of the time to the end of that time is your faith. It's only those who believe that will be able to see it because it will take a while. It will look opposite at one time. It will look like the opposite at one time. God sent a deliverer to Israel. The people were crying because of what? Hard and cruel bondage. Then the deliverer showed up. I am Moses, sent of the Lord. Behold, he turned water to blood. He turned uh, staff to serpents. And Pharaoh now says, oh, you can do magic, no problem. Yeah, start making bricks without straw. Use your magic and create straw. The people then cried the more. Remember, he came to deliver them from hard and cruel bondage. He now amplified and intensified the hard and cruel bondage. It looked like the opposite. Some people began to say, where well, with this Moses? We're better off without you. It was not the end of that test because even after the entire plague and they were set free and they got into the wilderness on their 40-day journey that turned to a 40-year journey, a time came when they were looking for cucumber. <laughs> they said they want cucumber and garlic. They said, rather than die in the wilderness, they said, did we not have plenty to eat in Egypt? Food of slaves. And they said that was better than dying. Why? Because the process will take a while. And the Lord is simply saying, it takes faith to bridge the gap between the word of the Lord and its fulfillment. It will take a process to get there. What then is this test of our faith? Remember I told you, in five minutes I can finish this message, but to give you a background, so what is the background we have been creating here? First of all, the strength and the object of our faith is that God is righteous. He's righteous to save. He's not just motivated. He is not just with the means to save us. He is with the ability. His righteousness is his ability to save us. Because you can have the means, you can have the motivation and not have the ability he has the ability. He has a legal backing, a legal premise for saving us. And we saw the reason that faith will be needed because for us to see that ability in him to save, it will take a long process sometimes. Therefore, he tells you, write the vision so you don't forget it. Because a time will come when you forget the prophecy. So how do you prepare for what you have forgotten? Say, so write it down. Don't forget it. Osas is, re, is, in the, is in the experience of a fulfillment of a prophecy he received early last year, right? Yeah. Early last year. He's, he has gone through process, but you know, hard times, ups and downs, doubts, times where you thought even the fasting and prayer is not going anywhere. But he has come and he's seen the breaking of a new day. And he still has to believe until everything is fulfilled. So Isaiah chapter 28 verse 16 tells us what that test of faith is. Isaiah 28 verse 16 says, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, 
Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation. A what? A tried stone. A precious cornerstone. A sure foundation. See qualification. <laughs> this one has been tested. <laughs> it says, whoever believes will not make haste. Because for you to arrive at this state, you will be a tried stone. You will be tried. You will be tried. You will be tested. So he says what? He who believes will not make haste. He who believes will not act hastily. The test of faith is patience. The test of faith is patience. Too many times, people would all stand up and say, the word you said has not come to pass. Oh. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Can I tell you something interesting? If you use logic to look at this Christianity, you will give it up also. Do you know what Jesus Christ said about us? He said, he who believes in me shall not die. Where are our fathers? The ones who wrote that scripture for us, where are they now? They're dead. You've not seen disappointment. <laughs> You've not seen process. It will look like disappointment. He says, he who believes in me what, shall not die. In another place, he says, he who believes in me has crossed over from death to life. Yet we die. Yet we die. He says, he who is born of God does not practice sin. And yet we fall. Why? Because there is a promise. There is a promise that God has given us, and sometimes it unfolds gradually in time. We will go through trials to reach the realization of that promise. I don't know if you are following this. The realization of those promises will take time. This is the beautiful thing about God. To show you that he's true to his word. Even when you die, you will rise again. <laughs> Somebody that can, can nullify death. I'll tell you a story, a true life story, true life story. A woman was given a prophetic word. She and her husband were given a word. They were, they were, sing, they were uh, married without children and were believing God for a child. And God told them, you will have a child. His name shall be named, I can't remember the name. It's John. And you will raise this John up together. A few years after, I can't remember if John had come or not. But John, if John had come, he was still young. He had not been raised up. The husband died. Remember the prophetic word and that experience, don't, don't tally. It's easy to say that prophetic word was not true. You say you will raise him up together. You know what the woman did? She took the prophetic word, went to the dead man, and says, man, the word of the Lord says, you and I will raise him up together. Come back. This man came back to life. See, it's not that things will not go awry. It's not that things will not go the other way. Contrary things will happen, but faith can nullify. Faith can rectify. Don't give up so quickly. This child shall not surely die. In and dies. Say, ah. No, 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 no. The man who believes says he's not dead, he's sleeping. Is that not what Jesus Christ told the disciples about Lazarus? Say, this sickness is not unto death, but he died. What do you do with your faith at that moment? Cast it all, all away. He died, contrary to what the Lord said. So when you're looking, say, oh, prophet, your prophecy did not come to pass. <laughs> I laugh. I love. Can I share one with you? <laughs> I received the word. I won't tell you the details of it. I've mentioned it in more mystery before, but today I'll unveil it a little bit more. I was given a word. I was minister in a very big conference. <sighs> I said, this thing looks impossible. The caliber of people that invite in this conference is just not. <laughs> but you know, I believe the word. And I was bathing and dressing up for that conference. See, for the day they were invited, I don't carry tablets to church except I want to preach. 
So if you see me with tablet, those I want to preach. <laughs> so I was carrying tablet. So when they would call me. One day I sat in the front. Don't worry, they call me. <laughs> <laughs> but do you know something happened? Days later, somebody who was watching live the conference called the man of God and said, Ah, I saw one prophet in your midst that gave one prophecy one time. Is that the one say yes, I have ministered? But you don't know how God wants to do it. You, you expect the grand opening. God will test you with the small ones first. How do you treat it? Let me tell you something about faith. I'm, I'm, still, I'm still talking about the test of faith here. One of the greatest tests of faith is how you interpret circumstances. Oof. If you fail to get this thing, I'm telling you, nothing will matter in your life. Nothing. I'm not talking about just this conference, not this teaching, no. Nothing else will matter in your life if you don't get this thing I'm saying. Because the devil will bring things, circumstances will come your way that will contradict something that God has said. If you don't know how to give the right interpretation, <laughs> forget it. That is one thing faith does. Can I tell you a story, true life story, my pastor? His mother was barren for many years. And she was very successful in business. And she was married to somebody. People now began to spread rumor that she sacrificed her womb to be successful in life. You know what she did out of the, the anguish of spirits and brokenness of heart? She left her marriage, left all her business, left Oh, she was a business tycoon. She left every, not a pen, she walked back home to her father's house. Then one day, one Afa came, because she was a Muslim family. The Afa came and met her father, who's a friend of her father, and said, Ah, I like this your daughter, I want to marry her. So she said, You cannot give birth. She's done down, barren, and say, I like her like that. That's how she got remarried as the number 10th wife. And as God will have it, after about 10 years in this new marriage, she gave birth to the first child. Not, I don't know if it's 10 years, but almost 10 years into the marriage, she got her first child. And the first child died. Now, this is a Muslim story, I'm telling you. But I want to tell you what faith is. Because he produced one of the greatest apostles that the world has ever seen. When the child was born, the first child that was born, after a few days or a few weeks, the mother said, let me go to the market and get something. Give the child to one of the senior wives at home. Please take care of my child. I'm coming back. Before she came back, the child was dead. That's the biological blood brother of Pastor Tino Bakari. I was dead. You know what the father said? He said, do not worry. This child came to clear your womb for the great child that is about to come interpretation of his circumstances. That was faith. You might say, how can a Muslim have faith? The Syrophician woman and the centurion, were they believers? No. But God said, I have not seen such great faith, not even in Israel, not even with the custodians of faith. I have not seen such great faith. This man had faith, and his statement was, this barren woman that had just luckily had one child, and the child is now dead. He said, the child came to clear road for the great one that will come. You'll be the judge if the one that came after is a great one or not. You'll be the judge. His life has been a remarkable miracle from time to time. He was born crippled. He used to crawl with his bum bum. Not with his knee, with his bum bum. That's how he crawls. And all the witchcraft about killing, one, killing each other's children, killing each other's children, say, your child will not inherit, your child will not inherit. Uh, leave this one, he's already dead, he's a cripple. He can't inherit anything. When they are finished killing each other, he now stood up and began to walk. <laughs> In fact, he didn't walk, he ran. His first time that he stood up, he ran. That's a man that has, because somebody believed God enough to say, God is not unjust. He said, you have faith. You are looking for good things. <laughs> what have you done with the bad things that God gave you? 
That is the test of it. What have you done with the bad things that he has given you? We will know if you believe. Not when it's rosy, but when there are tons and tissues. When you have tons and tissues, can you form a crown and wear your head like Christ Jesus on the cross? If you believe, you will reinterpret your circumstances. Oh, I lost this job. How do you interpret it? I lost this child. I lost this important opportunity. How do you interpret it? Do you interpret it as God is unjust? <laughs> the Bible says, with your mouth you shall be justified, and with your mouth you shall be condemned. The choice is yours. This is, you know, we have reduced this into positive confession. <laughs> yeah, it's beyond that. Positive confession has, it, it has nothing on this matter. Can we rise and pray? Do you believe, really? Do you really believe? Tell the Lord that you believe. I believe. I want to believe. Strengthen my faith, O oh Lord. Can you ask Jesus to strengthen your faith? Can you ask Jesus to strengthen your faith? To strengthen your faith. Ask Jesus to strengthen your faith. I want to believe. This is a test of faith. Because certain things will take time. Certain things may go the, the opposite direction. But you must believe. You and I must believe. I must believe. I must believe. I will believe. I want to know this God who is righteous to save. Who is righteous to save. Who is righteous to save. Man ke be santo bininanda. Me kemte libro non te bininanda. Help my faith, Lord. Strengthen my faith, Lord. Strengthen my faith, Lord. Strengthen my faith, Lord. Strengthen my faith. Strengthen my faith. You can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. Savior. To you be all the glory, to you be all the praise. And this moment, I want to pray for everyone who might be going through a waiting period. You might be like Habakkuk, and you are asking the Lord, say, Lord, how? How will a nation so cruel judge a nation better than it? You might be asking questions of how, Lord? How, Lord? Why, Lord? You might be finding it hard to accept the conditions of your transformation, of your promotion. Your faith might be running out. 
But today I declare, declare, declare by the power of the Holy Spirit that your faith will be boosted. Receive faith boosters in your spirit. Receive expansion of faith. The strength to believe even when the circumstances is contrary. Receive faith to believe in the mighty name of Jesus. Even when Lazarus dies, you will say he's only sleeping. <laughs> because you believe. Lord Jesus, help our unbelief. Strengthen us for the impossible. Empower us for the impossible. Too many people have given up hope because it didn't go according to what they thought it would be. We gave the prophetic word. I remember when the prophetic word came to me in the beginning, the Lord told me, Pastor Tune Bakari will become president. And at that time, he was contesting in the primaries. We had a panel of judges praying towards these things. And the Lord gave me a vision. I shared it with them. They are, they, they are witnesses. I shared it with them. I said, look at what the Lord told me. He will not win the primaries, but he will not lose the presidency. He, I said, I didn't believe the word. I said, let's counsel. Let's pray that he wins the primaries. <laughs> We prayed, and primaries came, and left, and he lost the prime. He didn't even get a single score. It was then I went back to the prophecy. This prophecy is because useful now. <laughs> and we began to, but it's my point. It didn't go according to the way we hoped. There are detours along the way. I pray that none of you will be here. Say, and they said it too. I really believe it though. Ah. May you believe. May you believe, even if it doesn't come the way you expect it to be, may you believe. Because he said to them, Lazarus, his sickness is not unto death, and yet Lazarus died. If they had stopped believing at that moment, what would have happened? A prophet came to meet a king and said, the Lord says you ask of him a sign. The prophet thought the king was a believer. The king said, don't Mother, you don't need to give him any sign. You would think the prophet was speaking out of the king was speaking out of faith. No, he didn't believe anything. He said, Because you do not ask, this is the sign the Lord will give you. A virgin shall conceive. Prophet died, king died. Virgin did not conceive. 700 years later, the prophetic word was fulfilled. May we not be part of that generation that dies in the wilderness. Because they did not believe that the Lord could set up a table in the wilderness. The common table is all he wants to set, and they didn't believe. He who created the heavens and the earth in seven days. Lord Jesus, we repent of our unbelief. In this journey, in this series of faith, begin to rewire us, begin to re energize us for faith, re energize us for belief that we will believe again, that we will be strengthened in our faith in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.